The material that you're about to listen to and engage with came from our 2017 Missiology Lectures when myself, along with my colleague Johnny Ramirez Johnson, said we need to do this next 2017 Missiology Lectures on this topic of race theology mission. And we invited Dr. Love Seacrest to engage with us in that process. We wanted to explore the challenging questions regarding racism and ethnocentrism and xenophobia and all of those issues from the perspective of world Christianity with regard to how these realities have existed in many parts of the world and also as part of the colonial mission endeavors. It is fascinating to think that the realities we were talking about are not the experiences of one individual or even one society. We're talking about whiteness as a way of defining the world. And the conference and the conference presenters address time and again this epistemology, this way of making meaning. It has also been described as colonization and post-colonization. The question is not, it's not about guilt, it's about engagement. It's about what are we going to do with what we have inherited. Uh, so the fact that we're having the conversation should not point a finger at you as a listener or viewer. But these are hard conversations. Um, the conversation about race is one that has been deferred for so long and so often, over and over again, as soon as we get close to having a meaningful conversation about race, um, we recoil from the pain of it. And so in our lectures, there are you'll see some of that pain emerge. You'll see some people who have long experienced racism uh, express and, de and declare and name experiences that they um, have had that have been deeply formative, deformative even. So this conversation is not a pretty one, but we're having it. As observers, as uh, listeners, you will be engaging and we invite you to invite the Holy Spirit. The three of us pray a lot about this series. Mm -hmm. We humbly submitted to God and pleaded for God's mercy to lead us. We are feeble and combined. We are imperfect and we have prayed that the Lord will fill the gaps. And the conversation is only a starter. It is in your hands. It is in your community. It is in your family. And most importantly, it is on your knees. Mm. I need you to ask yourself now, why am I here? Write it down, because you must be accountable to it. And then you have to ask yourself, given the reason why I am here, what will I do when I leave here? What will I do when I leave here? And whom am I going to do it with? We must be community. If we are to do this, because there is so much that has been so messed up for so long that we cannot unravel it and create a new future together unless we are with one another. And so I need you to look at somebody in the eye and say, we're going to do this together. We're going to do this together. In the name of the Lord. And this, this is our spiritual worship. This is our spiritual worship. You're used to singing and whatever, whatever. And then you talk while you sing or you move because, you know, that's my favorite song. No, this that we are about to do, that we are committing to do in this moment, that is our spiritual worship. Amen. Racism. If I asked you to do... A human sculpture of racism, it takes two of us to keep it going. Both the oppressed and the oppressor, 
must keep racism going. You see what happens if you let go? We're both going to fall together. So if we're going to, gracias. If we're going to do this together, we have to figure it out carefully. Because we have raveled it together. So think about that for just a moment. Keep that image. We have a lot to do. I'm going to talk about the personal, the historical and institutional, the conceptual, the theological, and the call. I'm of Puerto Rican descent. On one side of my family, we have been Protestant for three generations, and on the other side, we are Catholic. An itinerant preacher came to the Junque area, the tropical rainforest, and sleeping in a hammock at night, he traveled on horseback throughout the countryside, evangelizing and preaching to the homes he encountered. My great-grandparents became Protestant through his work. Later, when the family immigrated, they continued their Christian commitment in New York City at the Central Baptist Church of the American Baptist Churches. For three generations, we drank deeply of the scriptures, living as a covenantal, multicultural community, because there were about 14 different Hispanic groups. We're not just Hispanic, right? So we, were ha we had to learn to be very multicultural. As the work in the city of New York among Latinos continued to grow, the structure of the denomination included Latino leaders in the development of the new work. These leaders advocated for the funding of new congregations and for representation of Latinos at different levels of the denominational structure. Latino leaders in the denomination were at first part-time while pastoring a church and sometimes even being bivocational. They were the leaders who carried out the vision of the work. It was not for almost 50 years that Latino leaders were to come to the higher levels of leadership in the mainline denominations. This model of relationship took form in all mainline churches according to the variations of the free church or Episcopal structures that were informed by their ecclesiologies. In 2005, I attended a meeting for Hispanic leaders to discuss matters of theological education. At that point, I have been working on these matters for about 20 years as pastor, as director of a Hispanic program in a seminary, and as a professor at a theological school. We worked in groups in order to identify needs and strategies with the purpose of attending to those needs. This was an ecumenical group, which included Latino, mainline, Catholic, and Pentecostal Christians. As we returned from our groups, I listened to the reports of each one. The needs we had were similar across the groups. First and second generation issues, Latino clergy were dealing with lack of empowerment in their personal lives, their church structures, and their communities. And while my brothers and sisters who come from Latino councils may feel that they didn't have to deal with white structures, let me remind you that we still read translated books, and today we take online courses from schools that are white evangelical who may be known Justo Gonzalez, sometimes called Justo, but do not expose us, but do not expose us to the rich theological coffers of persons of color. This further perpetuates our thinking, therefore, that we don't do our own theology. As a matter of fact, there is no such thing. We must continue, therefore, to pass on la sana doctrina, which is the interpretation of the theology of those of the Anglo church as the real theology. I mean, after all, think about how many books you've read and which are the real books that you're supposed to be reading, right? Uh, yeah. This teaches us that white evangelical voices have more authority. We listen to them on the airwaves and our media. And that is how many Latinos were duped into thinking that Trump was chosen by God. And now they wonder why the chosen one is turning their lives upside down in such unjust ways. So all that is to say that even if we have not come from Anglo church structures, the theological ideological structures have still proliferated our lives. Yes, At the meeting in 2005, we concluded that we needed to understand how to do community work. We were looking for pastoral skills for counseling, especially for family, marriage, and parenting, with an understanding of how these dimensions of our lives are affected by immigration. 
We needed to understand poverty and lacked tools for doing economic empowerment. That's something every pastor should be able to have an understanding of. We needed resources for our communities, for our ministries, especially for lay leadership development. If you're a bivocational pastor, your lay leadership is empowered. We don't do this, you know, professional pastor thing. We do the called pastor thing, the servant. And everybody, everybody is the priesthood of all believers. What were the responses of our ecclesial bodies who understood, and as a matter of fact, they brought studies to us of all of this? No funding and no changes. Theological education did not include our theology or histories. This was compounded by the fact that our missionary heritage had not taught us a theology that would allow us to become involved in politics, and therefore community work was not something that every pastor saw as allowable. Look at the authority, right? This meant that some had not become vocal leaders in their communities around the very issues that most affected and disempowered their congregants and the communities that they served in. Seminary courses that would teach us the skills aforementioned, spaces for doing our own theological reflection were not accessible. We did not have faculty who had been in our communities who got it when we discussed the matters at hand. Instead, we found ourselves always having to explain to educate those whom we expected by now had educated themselves about the mission of the work of the people that they were teaching. The books we read did not represent our realities. Hispanic leaders of these different church structures were our middle persons, our intercessors and interpreters of the mission of the congregations. Many times the ordaining bodies did not understand theology and pastoral praxis from our perspective. Instead, they required that in order for us to be ordained, we give credence to the models used for the church of the dominant culture groups. If we use alternative models of theological education, it would not gain us the full rights of ordination. This could mean that when we represented the interests of our congregations in the full body of the church, we did not have full vote in the assemblies. It was not it was too similar to already being second-class citizens or non-citizens in society. What was the difference between the church and the rest of society as we engaged in these different arenas? Denominational resources were rarely allotted in accordance with the needs. We were at the margins, the afterthought of those creating budgets. I was hearing Hispanic pastors and denominational leaders referring to themselves as the dogs waiting for the crumbs to drop from the main table. When we received funds, the criteria for how long and how much we received had middle class expectations assigned to them. These issues represent only a few of the explicit expressions of racism embedded in the mission of the church. What was our response as Latinos? Ours is the oppressed mentality that if we stay in these relationships with the hope and the prayer that our oppressor will awaken to an ethic of loving in community, they will change. Well, it had not changed in the many years I have been a part of these groups. And I found myself coming to the conclusion that the church was a disempowering space as long as the structures kept us dependent. During this time, the denomination I belonged to, the American Baptist Church, had also afforded me opportunities that taught me so much about how to become a contributing citizen, although I also knew that these opportunities had been advocated for by my preceding generation of Latino leaders and those who were allies. Let's not think that because we're giving opportunities, that is because all of a sudden they you know, changed and it came from them. Let's look at the history of how that came about. There were also, however, those persons who had affirmed me in very powerful ways and executives who had stepped aside to allow leaders of color to come forward. We see the wheat and the tares growing together. It took me a while to figure out that understanding did not come based on an academic degree, but because one had opened up the heart to the other so that the desire to know was authentic. There was a knowledge that only compassion could bring. Until I learned this, I was sorely disappointed or frustrated with those to whom I had to explain matters which I expected were common sense and therefore general knowledge. I had failed to see that this was beyond general knowledge. It was knowledge of issues of power and privilege. 
Comprehension of who we are as Latinos did not exist even after so many years of coexisting with us in the church. We had not come to the compenetración of the perichoresis of communion. What history and theology has informed this? The history of racism implicates all of us, no matter if we play the role of oppressed or oppressor in it. Racism is a dance, a relational pattern, and it takes both sides to keep it going. I borrow from the words of Paul in an epistle to the Romans, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're all busted, so let's approach this with common <laughs> humility. Sin requires repentance. Repentance is more than guilt. Guilt makes us culpable, blameworthy, responsible for the wrong perpetrated, but doesn't create change. Guilt is like a stagnant body of water where stuff just grows in it, a cesspool. That's how come when I see all this white guilt, I go, oh, Dios mío, it just smells in here. <laughs> I can, I, it can even uh, paralyze our lives at times. Shame is similar. It is chagrin, embarrassment, discomfort, humiliation, distress caused by the consciousness, and consciousness is an important word, of wrong behavior. The difference is that guilt can be a private or simply a legal matter, while shame speaks more to how we feel as we confront community or the public when we do something wrong, as it can bring about dishonor, disgrace, or ignominy. Sin is deeper for it points to the breach in relationship and to the indebtedness that results from our actions. It's interesting that in Leviticus and Numbers, it speaks of the restitution owed to the one wronged as well as the guilt offering owed to God. Repentance in the New Testament is the turning from evil and returning to God in order to turn to good or righteousness, right relationships. To turn away from God is apostasy. When we are in a state of apostasy, we are in idolatry. Please keep that in mind because I'm going to suggest that we've been living in idolatry. These are practices involved in the worship of idols, other gods, and therefore returning to God is to turn from these practices which entails recognition of the wrong intention in order to change it, and goes deeply even unto our motives and deeds. To turn to God is a practice. It's not an event. It's a practice that begins with confession. 1 John 1, 9 reminds us that confession is a part of repentance, and it's needed when we ask God's forgiveness. It was accompanied in the Old Testament by public ceremonies, fasting, displays of sorrow, such as ashes and sackcloth, liturgies and songs, most probably songs of lament. But at times, the prophets chided the people for carrying out these rituals. <clears throat> with no true desire to change, and they would urge the people to convert or to obey God. The change in the relationship with God was necessary to bring the people to repentance. Now, all good evangelicals know this already. Why are we rehearsing it in this space? As highly intelligent people, we are able to rationalize our sins away. And so it has been that over the years we have set policies that have fit the realities of those that we know and the missional and institu institutional goals and structures that are a part of it. We have continued to promote the values of privilege, giving privilege to the people who are most that we are most familiar with. Our structures have relegated the others to marginal spaces and diminished budgets. If and when they become the focus of our attention, it is as objects in the space of our charitable, not missional actions. Mission should come from a deep conviction of the lordship of Christ and radical discipleship. Instead, pseudo-mission is pity. Pity creates distance between the ones suffering and the one helping. The helper is seen as the stronger one and the suffering as weaker. This way we can get our high from having helped. <laughs> However, in mission, there is an empathy, an identification that leads to a mutuality in weakness. That empathy also leads to a great imagination of the two parties in creating structures of justice together. 
It builds the fellowship. And I was so glad to see people hugging and kissing because we need a fellowship. It builds the koinonia that is needed for, for perseverance in doing the works of justice. We do racism together. We must do justice together. These matters are not only about the personal realms of our lives, but about the institutional arenas in which we move. While on a personal level, we may all be sinners, at the institutional level, not all have the power to turn their sin into a perpetual system that affects all realms of society. Racism is about power at an institutional level. Institutions perpetuate ideologies and practices that give expression to these. That's important that you keep that in mind. These roots of the sin of racism have become white supremacy today. White supremacy, and we have to define things. We can't just bat around things. We need to know what it is that we really are talking about. White supremacy is defined as the operation of social practices by individuals and institutions, including political and economic mechanisms, to achieve and maintain the political, social, and economic dominance of white people and the subjugation of peoples of color. Racism can be expressed in covert as well as overt ways. Mark Hearn speaks of colorblind racism, and theology, and how these relate to the practices of the church. He speaks of colorblindness as a method of racism today. He describes it as the false assumption that all people begin from the same starting point, when in reality they do not. He posits that refusing to acknowledge the effects of color in society contributes to the meritocracy argument and thus an attitude of superiority. I mean, after all, we're all the same, right? So, I mean, if you're not there, how come? How come? That's what's wrong with you. And so it's an attitude of superiority over those who have not achieved the same, adding into the negative perceptions of persons of color and placing them in subordinate and marginalized places. Killing me softly, baby. <laughs> it is racism that otherizes softly. Colorblindness denies the existence of public racism and charges persons of color with seeking to bring this unity and racial tension where there is none. Hearn states that it is this type of colorblindness racism that exists in the evangelical church today. How did this begin in the US? Colonialism and its need to dominate others in their own land in order to take over the land and the self-determination of the peoples fueled the social construction of race. Peruvian sociologist Aníbal Quijano posits that racism was the organizer of colonialism in the Americas. It was a construction that used biblical interpretation and theological tenets to create a strong argument to rationalize the political dominance of the colonial powers. It conquers by creating an opposing worldview to the existing one, creating confusion and disruption to the way of life of the people. As persons of Latin American and Caribbean descent, the gospel comes to us through military conquest, the symbols and the sacred text of Christianity, whether it's Catholic or Protestant expression, were used to bring peoples into submission to powers that raped, robbed, and killed. It's a testimony to the power of the gospel that as people of color, we believe after all the sacred symbols have been polluted. But at the same time, the missionary who also, uh, the missionary movement also brought education and the funding of positive social change. Relationally, there were missionary leaders who showed deep commitment to the work and to the peoples while unconsciously continuing to operate within the structure of relationships of superiority. It is helpful to look at racism Look at how racism becomes essential to the expansion of the United States and the role of religion in the formation of the ideology of manifest destiny. This is a term for the attitude prevalent during the 19th century period of American expansion that the United States not only could, but was destined to stretch from coast to coast. This attitude helped fuel Western settlement Native American removal and war with Mexico. Manifest destiny was undergirded, 
by social theory. Hopefully, okay, because I'm skipping stuff. That's how come I have to skip over there too. Manifest destiny was undergirded by social theory, science, and theological biblical understandings. The U.S. were God's chosen people, and as such, they were destined to take the land. God's creation, natural and human, was there for the benefit of the chosen nation. Expansion and slavery fed on each other. The philosophy of manifest destiny was founded on an understanding of the God of Protestantism. The chooser was this God. Once we have established God's Unique favor and choosing, it becomes a very powerful concept. Its implications are capable of creating much in inequality, hatred, and violence. Divine chosenness and capitalist economic interests went hand in hand. As theology and the endeavors of Christianity were co-opted by the colonists, theology generated knowledges of white supremacy, not of the Basilea practices of oppression and not salvation or liberation. Economics and race were about control of the land. The idea of inferior races was important for rationalizing the control of the land and human resources. Enslaved peoples, indigenous and African in Latin America and the Caribbean were defined as an inferior species created to serve Europeans. They were a species that had mental and spiritual deficiencies that required them to live under Christian tutelage as a way of correcting their deficiencies. The slave trade, the encomiendas therefore, were legitimate within the parameters of human and divine laws. Slaves were mandated by God to serve masters. Their freedom was only from personal sin. The Bible was used to give evidence of this reality and gave Europeans control over every aspect of the lives of the enslaved and of peoples in their own lands. Christianity and its missiological endeavors, therefore, has been deeply criticized in the 20th century for being the religious arm of the European colonial powers and later of the United States. However, this was not always as clean cut as one may think, for oftentimes the missionaries were also the defenders of the rights of the peoples that they serve. This demonstrates the possibility of having motive and intention of love beyond the structural purposes of colonization. If that possibility did not exist, we need not be here. It is the intention that bears the fruit to the work of true mission. This convoluted legacy of the gospel understanding and self-understanding of power over and subjugation because of racial indifference has been embedded in the religion and culture, and therefore it shapes the ways that we relate to one another. It has built the epistemologies, worldviews, laws, and educational institutions of our times. There isn't a perspective or institution that has not been marked by this legacy of hatred and its accompanying violence. The very lenses with which we read scriptures has been colored by it. Racism has depended on the categories of racialization. These have taken a variety of different forms. After slavery was abolished, it took the form of Jim Crow and debt servitude. After the civil rights, it went to police profiling, to the prison industrial complex and felonized disenfranchisement. The anti-immigrant movements in the United States and across Europe are also a part of the new racialization. In the United States, detention centers have become an extension of the prison industrial complex. Immigration is interrelated with the global economy. Industrialization in the 19th century was accompanied by colonization, which required a rightless mass of workers. Later, deindustrialization in the 20th century commodified the bodies of persons needed for the large service economy it had created. Immigration from, from former colonies has taken place, not to mention the new forms of human trafficking of persons for forced labor and sexual slavery. When people of color have migrated to the lands of origin of the colonial powers, the deep roots of racism have come to the surface. The slippery arguments today have masked it as an argument about the rights of persons based on citizenship. Aviva Chomsky in her book, They Take Our Jobs and Other Myths, asks, what makes a person eligible for rights? Do we all have rights by virtue of being human? 
If rights are restricted to a select group of people, citizens, then who decides who is a citizen? How do the political views compare to the biblical views? The Imago Dei is the biblical grounding for the rights of all persons based on their equality at creation. However, those who have substituted the biblical narrative for the racialization categories have seen the immigrant through the lens of the category of an illegal alien. We didn't come in spaceships. Some churches, <laughs> some churches have gone as far as refusing to, this is the truth, refusing to baptize those who are alternately documented because they are in sin since they are living outside of the law. No attempt has been made to even ask if the law is aligned with the values of the gospel. Still, others have exiled congregation members who have voted for the rights of the immigrant, labeling them as traitors to the United States and traitors of God because God has chosen the United States and a vote for the undocumented immigrant is a move against the will of God to bless this nation. I have also witnessed the distribution of flyers recruiting persons to be Minutemen at the door of a church in Nogales, Arizona. Amen. The church has chosen loyalty to the law without a critical theological reflection that would define our loyalty to Christ in light of the law and the situation. Do you see the idolatry? But if we want the law, then come on, let's examine the rights of persons according to the law. After World War II, when the world experienced the, hor the horrors of Nazism in 1948, the United Nations General Assembly passed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, asserting that everyone has all the rights and freedoms without distinction of, and here's the list, race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth, or other status. It also guarantees social and economic rights like the right to work, to equal pay, and the right to education, food, housing, and medical care. In the United States, however, the Constitution is more ambiguous so that the same rights that belong to the people are not the same as the rights that belong to all people. This ambiguity has been used to exclude some persons from rights and to benefit employers who can then exploit by excluding. We, when you exclude someone from citizenship, then you can exploit them, right? Because while they tell us, oh no, they're taking our jobs. Yeah, you wanna come and pick cotton? Hello? Yeah. So they do this, right? They do this, okay. We need to understand that exclusion by citizenship is based on racism and used for the same reason that the construct of racism was invented to create a mass of rightless workers. Illegality is a new codification of inferiority and the maintenance of coloniality, a social structure with the financial goals of the wealthy in mind. That's right. That's right. I have no time to talk to you about the 14th Amendment. But let me just say that we have simply shifted how we interpret the Constitution and the rights of persons in the US depending on the times in which we live in. The changing economy at this time also allowed for a secondary sector of jobs that were subcontracted and moved from regulated to unregulated sector jobs while other jobs were being outsourced. Many rights that laborers had won over the years slipped away as a result. The economic hopelessness that this created for the poor populations, the war on drugs, and today the war on terrorism has increased the prison population and detention centers, creating a new industry of prisons and security. And I hope that you know that we don't just have federal prisons anymore, we have, a corp we have corporations of prisons, okay? They are privately owned. Prison corporations have doubled their revenues from the immigration detention business in the years between 2005 and 2012. Am I in the right place? Okay. They also have a powerful lobby base and have lobbied for harsher sentences. It behooves us to wonder if the incarcerated under such a system are not really political prisoners. Prisons provide income for small towns, making prison and security a prime economic strategy for these towns. Growth in the prison population has become a return on the investment of stockholders. Detention is part of mass incarceration and a new source of income for investors. 
This historical continuum of racism and its variety of expressions in the different institutions of our society have confronted the church with a challenge. How has her mission addressed or failed to address these challenges? Allow me to discuss briefly how the church's self-understanding, which informs her mission, can be mixed with the worldview of her times, causing her to side with the other gods. A case study of this, I can't tell you everything, but bits. A case study of this in the Disciples Church in Texas during the years of Manifest Destiny. Historian Daisy Machado speaks to us of this. There was much immigration taking place and the border ethos saw Mexicans in Texas as inferior others. Carter Boren makes the following statement about the work of the disciples with Mexican Texans. Indifference, okay. Indifference and racial prejudice largely characterized the relationship of the Texas disciples toward opportunities for service among both Negroes and Mexicans. I'm quoting. The size of these racial elements in the state, especially in regard to Mexicans and their limited economic and social status, have offered unusual opportunities for an extension program of service that has been neglected. This resulted in the neglect of the work's potential. Resources were not invested for the development of indigenous leaders or materials in Spanish for creating a Latino church in the margins. Latino pastors were poorly paid, yet they continued to work faithfully and with a vision that comes from love for the people as a part of the mission of Christ. If the work advanced, it was due to their faithful perseverance. The view that leaders of the disciples' church had toward the Mexican Texans echoed that of the culture of the time. Mexicans were seen as low-status persons without education who would bring down the possibilities of the advancement of the work. The Mexican leaders were seen as helpers and were not given equal status with their Anglo counterparts. When the work did not prosper, God was praised. But when it didn't, there was no an analysis, but blame was blamed placed on the Mexican Texans, who by virtue of who they were, made the work that much more difficult because they were seen as, I quote, ignorant, irresponsible, roving, and superstitious. Tejanos were displaced from their lands. Part of the history of displacement included the lynching of Mexican Texans. The lynching of persons of Mexican origin and descent between 1848 and 1928 is documented by Carrigan and Webb. Between these years, Mexicans were lynched at a rate of 27.4 per 100,000 of population. During the same time period, the rate of lynching for African Americans was 20 to 52.8 with the highest rate in Mississippi with 52.8 victims per 100,000 of population. Mexicans were lynched at similar rates as African Americans in other southern states. These murders were rarely investigated except under federal pressure after some years of diplomatic pressure by the Mexican government with President Porfirio Diaz's efforts to facilitate trade links between the two countries and that led to the documentation of the injustices and abuse along the Texan border. This history of expansion in the southwestern border states shed light on the issues of immigration today. They do remember the Alamo. These are the new acts of racism masked by the rhetoric of citizenship. This history is an example of how the power and the influence of an ideology shaped not only the political and socioeconomic agenda of the Southwest border, but the mission of the Protestant church as well. Had the disciples been able to expose the outside ideologies to the scriptures and to critically reflect and regulate external forces, they could have become an influential witness at the border, shaping its ethos differently. Instead, their theological paradigms mirrored their wor worldview and their missional practices and patterns were shaped by the Southwestern ideology of conquest, which created racial paradigms of inferiority and otherness. We can see that as a case study, ask yourself where you're standing today. Today, the white evangelical church creates a theology that sees the immigrant through the lens of a law that criminalizes the immigrant and then responds biblically by quoting verses about respecting the law of the land without asking if the law is just or without consulting the biblical witness of how the foreigner is to be treated in one's land. As a result, it has indiscriminately condoned the unjust treatment of immigrants in similar fashion to the lack of just response 
to the lack of just response of the disciples' church in their treatment of Mexican Texans. These same churches, these same churches will then conduct missions in Mexico or other Latin American countries. It is a feel-good sense of mission without a serious reflection of the reason why it's okay to love your neighbor on the other side of the border while criminalizing the same neighbor who moves to this side of the border. This slice of history demonstrates how white supremacy lives within a matrix of structures. The practices and mechanisms of this form of dominance are invisible to those that carry them out. It is a social construct whereby knowledge of the world is filtered through the lens of whiteness. These are the judicial systems, the structure of government, and the educational and legislative systems. They are promoted by way of the media, the arts, and education. As such, it makes up the world of white persons and becomes the norm. And as the norm, it makes up the world of everyone in this room. We inherit the construct as a process of socialization that teaches us to adapt and fit into it as we make meaning of life situations. In Spanish, we say, las estructuras crean hábitos. Structures create habits. They hold together the basic facilities, services, and installations that are needed for the functioning of an organization, a community, or a society. They regulate life, the texture of our social existence, and therefore, our spiritual living is impacted by the complex web of structures. Structures incarnate the ideologies or the philosophies that define the values of our institutions as such. They can then be the expression of righteousness or injustice. It is structures that create a consciousness out of which people live their lives. To understand re repentance, we need to understand consciousness. Consciousness is when our brain acts like an echo chamber of sorts, where beliefs and processes can hang around and become a part of who we are. And then such things acquire influence in us because they persist as thoughts and they become patterns of behavior. To transform an ideology, because that's what we're here to do, right? That's what we said that we're about to do. So we need to understand this stuff. To transform an ideology and hence its power, one needs to generate a new consciousness with the purpose of developing critical movements or mobilization that requires group action and practices for engaging one's energy in ways that reinforce a different ideology and that have the goal of creating change of an unjust system. This sounds to me like what the Lord requires of us. It sounds like worship in spirit and in truth. Generating a new consciousness involves coming to an awareness of one's cultural blindness and ideological filters through which we interpret the world. Now, this may sound like an unending academic exercise of critique, but fear not, <laughs> because the strongest critique does not take place in a classroom, but by seeking to identify with the oppressed, it's called real solidarity, not the one that you read about. It is this lived out exercise of discipleship. What is it? Lived out exercise of discipleship that moves one to the transforming of perspective. Now, I can't talk to you all about convictional experience and so forth, because this fine brother has already told me that my time is out. So let me move more quickly. <laughs> Christian. <laughs> Christian spirituality is meant to sustain our new life of discipleship. It is attentiveness to the Holy Spirit and participation in her initiatives. You want to talk Holy Spirit? You want to unleash it? Pay attention. The Basilea is a communal initiative of the Spirit. It emphasizes the corporate nature of our lives of faith. Covenant, the knitting together of those lives, is needed for forming and equipping a community whose character makes visible the gospel. Visible. If we are to learn and live in continued change, we need communities of support and accountability where we reread the scriptures with an eye for a new identity. This may commence 
as a personal understanding, but must move to a critical social consciousness, and then brings about a theology which urges us to live the gospel through our actions in our local communities as we seek to transform injustice and alienation. Only the incorporation of our commitment into concrete action will sustain transformational learning that becomes incarnational. All learning under Christ's lordship needs to have the outcome and the goal of being incarnational learning. I don't know what your assessment pieces say, but that's what I understand. Through a theology of mission integral, Latin American theologians present a Christology of mission that offers an avenue that shifts our loyalties. It is based on the confession of Jesus as Lord or Kyrios. How many of you sing, he is Lord? You need to act, he is Lord. The confession of Jesus as Kyrios is the recognition of his sovereignty over all of human life and all that works against that life and all of creation. To confess Jesus as Lord is equivalent to affirming that the reign of God is a present reality in our history through the person and the work of Jesus through the Holy Spirit. I can't do this without the Holy Spirit. How many of you know that? It provides a powerful critique of society that can move us to radical discipleship. Radical discipleship. Everybody say that. It calls for rejection of all ideologies, all gods that do not represent the values of the kingdom of Jesus, the Kyrios who invites the disciple to participation in the orders of the world that now are serving the market so as to proclaim the values of the gospel in their midst. Love, service, and the cross. Oh, she had to say the cross. You know, you're the only campus that has that very, very vivid sculpture out there of Jesus being nailed to the cross. If you sit there in the light of what we're saying here, love, service, and the cross are the triad of these diaconal and prophetic communal living. It implies the practice of mutual help, the confession of our sins, hospitality, and financial partnership with those who are in financial need. This is a picture of mission under a theology of Basilea with Jesus as the Kyrios who is reconciling all things to himself. I'm going to pass a couple of pages that really speak to the Trinitarian part of mission that speak to perichoresis because we don't have the time. One, two, three. This understanding of God's presence embodiment and diversity as imago dei opens our eyes to the reality that institutions are to be sacred spaces for being attentive to the presence of God. So if anyone says this is my seminary, if the board seems to think that this is theirs, they're in trouble. Because these are sacred spaces for being attentive to the presence of God in others. A space where we may welcome a diversity of people to learn new things in new ways. In this perichoretic dance, we internalize each other. So that you are always present to me, even when physically we are afar. So, just because you don't have one of us on your board doesn't mean that we can't be present. If you have internalized me... I am present. You have changed my world, and now I see it differently because I see it with you in it. And when I am using my power and my privilege to make decisions about policies and I take actions, I must do them so that they resemble the Basilea and so that they keep you in mind. A significant element in mission is the preaching of the gospel. Missional preaching, this is gonna be my last point, believe it or not. Missional preaching is proclamation to a dabar word, the Hebrew notion of the word becoming a happening as it is being pronounced. John, in his gospel, describes God's great love, healing, and salvation for us, saying that the word of God, the grace of God, became real in the person of Jesus. The word became flesh. Preaching is not for stimulating the minds so that the hearers could talk about it, process it, or comfort themselves with it. It is to activate the love and the grace of God to the poor in whatever condition they find themselves. If this love is to confront white supremacy, it must persevere in the practices of social critique, the study of the word, 
prayer, and mission as justice. If you had not kept social critique within the spiritual practices, it's time. Because this then becomes an incarnational word. This signifies that the kerigma is more fully expressed when there is both a knowing dimension and a doing dimension. It is a witness through both words and deeds. No faithful proclamation can take place without an action which points toward the salvific activity of Jesus. The strongest critique and missional gate toward the transformation of white supremacy is solidarity. Such missional proclamation motivates people to become involved in sharing the benefits which they are receiving with others as subjects and not objects. Biblically based mission is in harmony with the good news. Full understanding of the good news does not come to us except as we walk in the ways, as we turn into action the words we have heard. It is beyond what's in your commentary and all the exegesis in the world. That word will not become accessible to you until you decide to obey it. When we are hearers as well as doers, then full access to that word comes and it activates the love and the grace of God to those oppressed by white supremacy, both oppressors and oppressed. Biblically based mission is an enfleshed word, the place where we see the social performances of the Christian life as a countercultural stance, as witness, moving away from apostasy as idolatry. Such a word becomes a movement, a force. The power of love, for God is love, the dunamis that transforms. This is not a lofty ideal. It has been carried out in the past by evangelicals. In the 1830s, Theodore Weld held the position of immediate abolition while others believed in gradual abolition and colonization. Well entered Lane Theological Seminary in Cincinnati with the motive to, under, to introduce anti-slavery sentiments by having the whole subject thoroughly discussed. In the spring of 1834, he convinced fellow students to challenge the others to an 18-day debate on the two positions. You think I'm too long? <laughs> At the conclusion, the students voted almost unanimously in favor of immediate abolition. And it says that they followed the di dictates of sound strategy and they proceeded to organize an abolition society whose officers were all Southerners. They started churches across the South preaching abolition and for this, they were lynched, the cross. They rescued runaway enslaved peoples from their captors by kidnapping them and sending them off through the Underground Railroad. For this, they went to jail. They started special projects for the empowerment of African Americans in Cincinnati, and they eventually had to leave the seminary because, you're gonna love this one, they were banned for carrying doctrine into practical effect. <laughs> for real. So they started a new institution, which became known as the seedbed of radicalism, radicalism. And it was Oberlin College, which perpetuated, yeah, <laughs> which perpe it was started in order to perpetuate the revivalism and the social positions of Charles Finney, who refused to give communion to anyone who owned a slave because he preached that it was sin. Amen. Who do we give communion to today? So, where are the radical Christians today? Is the church an institution for perpetuating radical discipleship? My friends, you can't just have a concern for this topic, you need a commitment. You can't just have a theology, we need motives. We need to move from conversation to concrete witness and manifestations of the spirit of God's love. Because Jesus said to us that these things shall we do and even greater things. Are we the people of even greater things? Are we the people of even greater things? 
From this point forward, ask yourself in the presence of each other and in prayer to God, holy God, what do you want me, us, to do upon leaving here? So that the next conference <laughs> will not be about the same thing. But we will be telling the stories and giving a witness to the glory of God for the abolition of racism. And we will celebrate and continue to hold each other accountable. So look at each other. We're going to be sitting at table, walk and talk together about what we will do to perpetuate a radical discipleship that will pick away at racism. Amen.